Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us and our friends at Health Point Midway for hosting today's session on e EKGs, uh, seri mini series number two, ischemia and other uh, ST and T wave abnormalities with Dr. Charles Shulman. Dr. Shulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School from 1988 until 2016. He is currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconese Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he has been practicing non-invasive cardiology since 1970. Dr. Shulman's scientific articles and abstracts have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Circulation, the American Journal of Cardiology, and the British Heart Journal. And he is one of our wonderful Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Shulman, when you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Kristen, <clears throat> and, and good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I hope you're, you are all well. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, but before we begin, we actually have uh, three disclosure uh, slides, uh, which are uh, mandated by uh, UCLA Medical School, the Geffen School of Medicine, uh, 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 in order for us to, uh, in order for the participants to receive uh, CME credit. Uh, the first uh, slide uh, is that uh, this is uh, truly independent, is free of commercial uh, influence, uh, which is different from a from a commercial from a uh, promotional talk. Uh, second is that nobody in this that has anything to do with this particular talk has a, an affiliation with organizations that have inter, uh, interests related to the content of the program. Uh, uh, that is, that is, there are no conflicts of interest. And the uh, program is uh, designated as uh, Category 1 credit uh, for uh, one hour. Uh, so with that, let's begin. We're going to talk about the uh, ST segment from T-Wave, uh, portion of the electrocardiogram, and uh, normality and abnormality of that, sec uh, of that uh, section of the ECG. So here's what we're talking about here is uh, uh, P, QRS is uh, the distribution of the, of the uh, uh, electronic wave th through the ventricles. And starting with the J point at the end of the QRS uh, is the ST segment and uh, T wave. addition, the QT interval uh, starts at the beginning of the QRS and goes to the end of the T wave. Uh, the ST segment uh, correlates with the plateau phase uh, of the uh, action potential of the contractile cell. Uh, measurement points are the J point, which is the end of the QRS segment, and then whether there's ST segment elevation or depression. It's uh, depicted here and will be depicted uh, here and on uh, many of our uh, of my subsequent slides. Uh, now, uh, uh, the first thing we'll uh, address is uh, STEMI, that is ST elevation myocardial infarction. And in this case, um, uh, what happens is the uh, T wave. Uh, the vector, uh, ST segment vector, uh, begin by traveling toward the electrode question. So the first uh, manifestation of acute myocardial infarction uh, with uh, ST elevation is actually an elevated or a, a, a tall T wave called hyperacute T wave. Subsequently, there's ST uh, elevation. And, uh, this shows different characteristics of ST segment elevations caused by ischemia, uh, convex straight upsloping, straight horizontal, straight downsloping versus non-ischemic ST elevation, which is concave. Um, actually, this, this, little, this little cartoon uh, illustrates that by uh, uh, 
a frowny uh, looking uh, ST segment versus a smiley looking ST segment. So the uh, first case is a 68 year old man who complains of chest pain. Um, and here's his electrocardiogram. It has premature beats. These are two uh, PVCs here, uh, several more here. Uh, uh, in this case, native, native conduction in leads uh, uh, one, two, and three are, aren't really seen very well, uh, only over here. And you can't tell anything about the ST segments. However, notice that there, there is a minimal, if anything, ST elevation of lead AVL and a, an extremely tall uh, T wave, two, B3, and B4, and B5. They're extremely tall. These are hyperacute T waves. And you can tell that they're hyperacute T waves because they're out of proportion to the QRS 45 minutes later, uh, ECG looks like this, uh, in which case there's ST segment elevation. And, and I think nobody's going to miss the fact that there are, you know, there's ST elevation of lead one, lead AVL, and V2, 2 V5. So this is an acute myocardial infarction. ST, uh, an acute ST segment elevation due to a clot, generally an occlusive clot. Uh, now, uh, this is the evolution of acute coronary occlusion uh, that we used to see. We don't often see this anymore um, because of reperfusion. But uh, without reperfusion, uh, as the ST segment and T waves uh, go through this evolution. So there is the hyperacute T wave, uh, which lasts for minutes to hours, as I've already pointed out, then followed by ST elevation, followed by the development of a Q wave and the ST segment coming down, and then T wave inversion. And subsequently, there may be T wave recovery uh, with a Q wave remaining. However, if there has been reperfusion, as there often is uh, in 2022, 20, uh, uh, you get uh, ECGs that go from the hyperacute stage to this stage, which is a reperfusion stage with uh, ST segments uh, coming down to normal, but with T wave inversions. So this is a reperfusion stage or, or, or evolution of the acute myocardial infarction. Uh, this depicts the anatomic locations uh, and supplying uh, coronary arteries. So uh, leads one and AVL uh, and often uh, B5 and B6 uh, represent a lateral infarction. Uh, generally the left circumflex or a diagonal branch. The, uh, <clears throat> the leads 2, 3, and AVF are the uh, inferior uh, wall of the uh, uh, left ventricle, uh, generally the right coronary artery or the left circumflex. Uh, B1, B2 is a septal uh, LAD uh, and uh, up to the B4 uh, also represents anterior uh, infarction. Here's a man who complained of shortness of breath and almost, uh, almost fainted. He comes to the emergency room. And what he's got is a very slow rhythm. The ventricular rate is uh, in the mid 40s. And if you look down here, you can see P waves that can really march right through without any relationship to uh, QRSs. So here's one P wave, here's the next one, here's the next one, here's the next one. Uh, 
here, here. Now, a, a trick question is, is this sinus rhythm? Think about that for a minute. The answer is yes, it is. Right? The, the sinus, the atria are contracting at a rate of about 300, 150, 175. So that's sinus rhythm. It's sinus rhythm with third degree heart block and the P waves or atrial depolarizations have nothing to do with the ventricular depolarizations. Uh, now, the other thing, oh, the other thing I'll point out is that the ST, uh, the reason, the reason this, this man has uh, complete heart block is because he has ST elevation and needs two, three and AVF consistent with an inferior myocardial infarction. And because the ST segment is more elevated in three than it is in two, that is most likely to be in his right coronary artery. Okay. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, a, a stent was placed in, his, uh, in a mid right coronary artery occlusion. And here's his subsequent tracing, uh, which, which shows right bundle branch block, but uh, normal conduction. Uh, and this is the reason why inferior infarctions uh, uh, are associated with heart block. The blood supply to the AV node, the AV nodal artery, comes off the right coronary artery in 90% of uh, cases. So that's why people with inferior MIs have uh, heart block. Most often, it's not necessary to insert a pacemaker, and the heart block uh, recovers when uh, uh, the heart recovers uh, from the acute myocardial infarction when there is reperfusion. perfusion. Uh, now, uh, this is inferior posterior MI. So here are the inferior ST segment elevations. But in leads V1, V2, and V3, there is an ST, there is not ST elevation, there's ST depression. Uh, how do we know that represents in a posterior infarction? Because if you hold a mirror up to it, what it looks like is ST elevation. Let's see. Uh, and uh, and if you think about the vector, the vectors are traveling posteriorly. You see, there's the posterior portion of the ventricle. And, and the, the, the vectors are traveling toward the electrode, but the electrodes are, are uh, you know, at the back, in V7, V8, V9, and away from V1, V1, V2, and V3. Hence, V1, V2, and V3 have ST depression. Now, ST elevation is not always acute myocardial infarction. There are a number of co other causes uh, 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 which can be uh, uh, depicted in the, in, the, in the mnemonic elevation. So electrolytes like hyperkalemia, left bundle branch block, the E for early repolarization, V for ventricular hypertrophy, A for certain arrhythmia syndromes like Bukata syndrome, we're, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, uh, T for uh, Takatu, Takatsubo's disease, uh, I for infarct or injury like uh, contusion, uh, or inflammation like myopericarditis. Uh, we've seen that sort of thing with, with uh, COVID and severe uh, cases. Most of those are early in the pandemic. Uh, Osborne. Uh, Osborne J or J waves and non atherosclerotic uh, vasospasm. So uh, uh, there are a number of clinical clues to non ischemic uh, ST elevation. Uh, for early repolarization, think uh, young men, uh, often African Americans, uh, for uh, carnary vasospasm, think 
uh, cocaine use or other stimulant use, uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy for hypertension, uh, pace rhythm, uh, etc. <clears throat> so here is uh, ST elevation due to left bundle branch flow. Why QRS? You see here is the ST, ST elevation uh, that is not an acute myocardial infarction. It is um, merely due to the bundle branch flaw. Likewise, here's the left ventricular hypertrophy. It's a very tall voltage, and the ST elevation in V2, V3, a little bit in V1. This is uh, ST elevation due to left ventricular hypertrophy. Here's an ECG that was given to me by uh, Elio Fine, uh, may she rest in peace, who, who was the clinical director of the ECG lab at uh, Beth Israel uh, for 45 years. Uh, one of my partners said that uh, when she retired, they were going to close the hospital, which of course didn't happen. Um, uh, and she gave me this in uh, 1991, as you can see here. So here's a patient, here's a 67-year-old man uh, who's, who complains of chest pain at rest. And uh, he has these terrible looking uh, ST segment deviations, ST you know, elevations in the inferior leads and in the lateral leads with reciprocal changes. And we'll talk about reciprocal changes uh, in the anterior leads. Uh, okay, so are we going to uh, call the cath lab for this? Well, before we before they did, they gave him a nitroglycerin. This is taken six minutes later. The ST segment elevation, those nasty looking ST segment elevations are gone and he's, he's pain free. This is uh, uh, coronary basis spasm. Prince Metals Angina, or Marion Angina. Um, uh, here's a, a, a sequence of uh, changes on the ECG. Uh, and as you can see here, as, as the spasm takes place, the ST segments gradually go up, but it's associated with ventricular uh, ectopy, uh, which is uh, pretty nasty looking. Uh, and this shows uh, uh, the ST elevations of spasm. And this is a coronary arter arteriogram showing spasm. And after nitroglycerin, you can see that the, 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 ST, the ST segment elevations go away and the uh, arteries have uh, uh, dilated. Uh, here's a 36 year old man with a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, who complained of chest pain for several hours, uh, which was worse on lying down. He has ST elevation in the one, two, three, not really in ABL, but in ABF, and in V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Pain had a pleuritic uh, character to it. This man has uh, pericarditis. And pericarditis uh, changes are these ST uh, elevations that you see here that are uh, concave. Uh, and they're associated with PR depression in V2 and PR elevation. Uh, uh, this is a tracing that was given to me by uh, one of the uh, nurse practitioners in our clinic uh, because it said consider acute ST elevation MI. What you see is ST elevation, maybe, maybe in lead one, definitely in lead two, uh, possibly in three, definitely in F. Definitely out here lateral. It's 
concave up. And uh, the woman had the normal Bible signs and, and she looked, you know, normal blood pressure looked fine. And, but uh, when we dug out an old ECG uh, of this patient, it was exactly the same as this one. This is early recall. This is the early repolarization embryo. There's J point elevation, as you see here. And then there may be a J wave. Here's a J wave. It's this uh, so called dipsy doodle uh, after the QRS prior to concave um, SD segment. J point elevation. There's another example of it. Fish hook illustrate the J, the J, oops, sorry, oops, okay, sorry about that. All right, so here are, here is a patient who has, uh, we, we don't know any clinical history here, um, but there are these very tall T waves, as you see here. The question is, are they hyperacute T waves of an ST elevation MI, or are they hyperkalemia due to hyperkalemia? The answer is uh, they are hyperacute ST segment, uh, hyperacute T waves of an ST segment, ST elevation MI. Um, partly they're not pointy. Secondly, there are reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, reciprocal changes in a while. So uh, this shows some of the differences here. Hyperacute, so uh, hyperpotassiemia, uh, hyperkalemia, produces these uh, uh, very tall pointy T waves as opposed to hyperacute ischemia. You can think of it as uh, and, you know, puncturing your finger, uh, the hyperacute, uh, uh, excuse me, hyper, hyperkalemic T wave. Okay. Here's a woman in her 40s who was found down and brought to the emergency room. Uh, I think this comes from Dr. Smith, so this is in uh, Hennepin uh, County in, in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and uh, this person certainly has. Uh, Pointy T waves, doesn't she? Her K was 8.1. This is a follow up, uh, at which time the potassium was 6.5. They're still pointed, but not anywhere near like the other ones. And this is severe hyperkalemia. So, in addition to the pointy T waves, out of proportion to the QRS, uh, it also includes. Uh, ST uh, or uh, QRS widening and uh, uh, conduction abnormalities. You really can't see P waves here anywhere. So this, this is severe hyperkalemia. Now, here's a 68 uh, year old woman who complained of shortness of breath and palpitations for a week. She has a past history of hypertension, of uh, kid, chronic kidney disease. Uh, uh, and she, two years prior, had had a uh, non SD elevation MI uh, for which a stent was. Uh, uh, her rhythm is uh, rapid and irregular, as we can see here. Rapid, irregular, narrow complex rhythm. Uh, is uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, basically, it's atrial fibrillation until proven otherwise, which is uh, almost always the case. Atrial fibrillation is the commonest arrhythmia that we see. Um, she was anticoagulated and cardioverted to normal sinus rhythm and felt much better. Six months later, uh, symptomatic AF, AFib returned. She was treated with sodalol 
80 milligrams twice a day and was cardioverted again and again felt well in sinus rhythm, but had two, two syncopal episodes. What's going on here? Well, there's sinus rhythm. But look at the uh, ST segment T wave. Look how long that is. The normal QT interval is less than half of the RR interval, whereas the long QT is greater than half. And this is, there's no question that this is greater than half here to here. So the, next, so the next question is, what do you think caused her syncope? Does she have the sick sinus syndrome or sinus bradycardia? Does she have monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, does she have torsi de point, recurrent atrial fibrillation, GI bleeding, because she was anticoagulated, uh, or a stroke. And I will show you the answer on the next slide. The answer is she had uh, torsi de point ventricular tech, poly, what, what's called a poly, polymorphic as opposed to monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So here you see that the points go from tor torsad the point means twisting of the points. Uh, and so here the points are down, and here the points are up, and here the points are down again. A number of these episodes followed by a longer episode followed by a deterioration to flutter fibrillation, for which she had to be cardioverted. Or she had to be, actually, she had to be defibrillated. Um, the risk factors, so, so the reason I'm showing you this is uh, uh, because uh, torsade can be drug-induced, and you should all be aware uh, of that. Some risk factors for drug-induced uh, torsade include uh, three hypos, hypopotassemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, bradycardia of any kind, um, conversion of, from a fib, especially with a QT prolonging drug, which is what Sobolol is, heart failure, digitalis, baseline QT prolongation, uh, et cetera. And there are a number of drugs that that, that carry a risk of torsade. But this is an extremely edited uh, version of that list. The list, in fact, is a page and a half, single-spaced. Uh, uh, I mean, it's really long. Uh, so, but this gives you the flavor of, of the drugs that can do this. So antiarrhythmic drugs, antibiotics, Floxacin, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin, and chlorithromycin, and some of the antifungals can do it. Antidepressants or antipsychotics, <coughs> uh, tryptoline, lecithin, ephedrine, uh, fluoxetine, and then a number of others, including uh, methadone, sumatriptan, uh, and ondansetron. Hydroxychloroquine is another one. I, I, I took it off the list because we don't uh, see that used uh, uh, for COVID anymore. Uh, but hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin both can do it. So that's something else to be, to be aware of. Uh, and there, there are a number of scenar clinical scenarios that carry, carry torsade uh, risk. Uh, you know, it, it, two, two QT prolonging drugs, for example, uh, or a concomitant therapy of a QT prolonging drug with a, with, with a diuretic agent. Development of renal failure in a patient treated with a QT prolonging drug, for example. Um, and, 
that liver failure, and there are a number of others. This is again uh, a shortened uh, list of clinical scenarios where this can happen. So you should be aware of uh, the potential for drugs to cause torsade. Now let's turn to ST depression. There are the common causes of ST segment depression are ischemia, uh, what he calls strain, um, uh, digitalis effect, and hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and sometimes rate related changes. Uh, and in this situation, the vector is going away from the electrode, as is the T wave vector, going away from the electrode, giving you ST segment depression or T wave inversion. Uh, some of the characteristics of ST depression uh, uh, caused by acute ischemia are horizontal or downsloping uh, ST segment depression. Uh, and uh, uh, this shows uh, reciprocal changes. I promise you uh, uh, examples of reciprocal changes. So reciprocal ST changes or ST depressions uh, opposite the leads, opposite the leads that have ST elevations. So for example, in the inferior ST elevation, so ST elevation here, this is a right coronary lesion, ST elevation in three is greater than two, there's ST elevation inferiorly and reciprocal change in leads one and eight. Yeah. Uh, likewise, uh, or on the other side of the coin is uh, ST elevations in one and ABL with ST depressions in two, three, and ABL. So those are called reciprocal changes. Not those are not primary changes. Uh, and uh, okay, this. So now we turn to uh, non-ST elevation MIs and non-ST elevation MIs. Are characterized, or the ECG changes of non ST elevation MIs are characterized by ST depressions as shown here, uh, or T wave inversion as shown here. If we have a case, yes, we do. There's a 56 year old man who had an old inferior MI who complained of chest pain. That was an ST depression, leads one, two. And after treatment uh, and uh, relief of uh, ischemia, uh, those ST depressions are, are gone. Um, he had an elevated troponin, which means that he had uh, damage, had an infarction. So this is a non ST elevation MR. Now, these are ch ST changes that, that can occur during exercise. So during an exercise stress test. Uh, this, this panel shows what a normal uh, ECG will look like at, at a uh, at sinus tachycardia uh, due to uh, exercise. Where you may see, you may see this rapid upslope, uh, upsloping uh, ST change. These are normal. These become equivocal and there's slow minor ST depression or slow upstroke, uh, upsloping. That becomes, that becomes equivocal. Usually equivocal changes uh, disappear within the first minute post exercise. Uh, these on the other hand are ischemic, horizontal uh, ST depression or downsloping ST depression. In rare instances, you can see ST elevations. These are, these are pretty unusual. These are the common positive responses uh, to uh, exercise uh, stress patient with ischemia. Okay. This is hypokalemia. And, uh, that's, uh, 
depicted here and here. You can see that as the ST, as the potassium level falls, the STT uh, abnormalities uh, worsen. And this is characterized by uh, ST depression. And on a prolonged QT interval, as noted here. So here is a 63 year, a 65 year old man who has uh, atrial fibrillation uh, and is uh, taking digoxin. He has a slow and regular rhythm, 51 beats per minute. This reading is wrong. There is no competing junction on Facebook. Uh, and, and the ST segments are, are the giveaway because this kind of scoopy looking ST segment is due to digoxin. The ST segment itself is not digitoxic, but uh, the slow regular rate is, this is probably a junctional uh, pacemaker uh, implying that there is heart block uh, uh, from digitoxicity. Oh, yeah, this is the ST segment uh, of digoxin. I usually put the pill of digitalis right in here, uh, or uh, if you look at Salvador Dali's uh, uh, mustache, uh, it gives you the same, the same shape. Uh, and and uh, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, another manifestation of digitoxicity. Uh, yellow vision. Um, it's thought that uh, Vincent van Gogh uh, was uh, digitoxin. This is a picture of a, a foxglove plant from which digitalis was uh, uh, produced. Here's a picture of Vincent, a self-portrait of Vincent looking very yellow, holding a foxglove plant. And my understanding is that in those days they used the jacks the digitalis to treat uh, depression, which of course doesn't do anything for, uh, and except made him uh, digitoxic. Uh, it did not make him crazy and cut the, uh, the and cut cut off his ear. Uh, this is a starry starry night, pretty yellow. So that's that's just a curiosity. Um, and so uh, uh, my final, my final, uh, my parting shot, I'll call it, uh, is this. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> and with that, I say thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank Incidentally, you, I, I, I've given you my email in case you think of something later. Uh, or you want me to look at an EKG, although although we we recommend that you put uh, actual consults uh, through through on the uh, uh, VC platform. Yes. So just like Dr. Shulman said, if you think of a question later, you have a challenging EKG or any kind of question, you can just put it right onto our um, our on demand or I'm sorry, our VC page, and you can submit it that way. Um, we'll get to it. We have a question or uh, some on uh, some more general topic. Okay. Send me an email. I'll be glad to respond. Thank you. Um, just a reminder: you can put your questions in the Q and A box or the chat box. Um, we do have one question. What measurement differentiates hyperacute T wave from peaked T wave of hyperkalemia? Kalemia. What measurement? There is no. It's not a measurement. It's it's a, uh, a pattern. Uh, okay. If you want me to go back to that? I right, go ahead. So, uh, <clears throat> although the QT interval may be longer 
and hyperacute ischemia um, than in hyperkalemia. It's really the pattern. You see this really pointy uh, T wave as opposed to a tall but rounded uh, T wave. It's the pointy right there. Small problems. Okay. All right. I don't see any other questions, but we're going to pause so you can get your questions in. I'm just going to real quick um, while we're waiting, do a little uh, plug for our clinic portal. So if you go onto our Maven Project, um, the website, you'll see up here it says clinic portal. If you click on that, we'll give you everything that you need to submit your med consult. So that e-consult, if you wanna get in touch with Dr. Shulman, our upcoming education sessions, um, our recorded sessions, and if you wanted to request a mentor, um, so you have all of that right at your disposal. So please make sure you use that. And if you have any questions on that, you can always reach out to me or to Aaron um, McGrath. All right, still no questions. <laughs> all right. We'll pause. You have a and question? No questions. Oh, okay. I know. We're questionless today. Oh, no, we have one. Oh, it just says, great session. Thank you so much, Dr. Shulman. <laughs> okay, you're quite welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, just a reminder, I know this is, uh, might be a little new. When you close out of this, when you close out of your Zoom webinar, on a, t uh, in a tab on your browser, the CME survey is going to appear. Make sure you do that so you do get CME credit for this. If you miss it, it'll be in the email tomorrow. But since there are no questions, and I think I've stalled long enough, Dr. Shulman, thank you so much uh, for presenting today. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining. Okay, very good. Thanks everybody. Have a good, have a good, have a good week. Take care. <laughs>